Well, there used to be a time where the weak among us, the helpless, the elderly, the young, the women, whatever the case may be, whoever it may be, the disabled, the weak among us, for whatever reason, were protected. They were guarded. Okay? Society felt an obligation to those who were small, like Charlie, to those who were small, like Jillian, to those who were small, like some of the babies we haven't even met yet. Felt an obligation to the elderly, felt an obligation to females and women in particular to protect them and to guard them. And it was the men in society that were supposed to do this. They were supposed to guard their people, whoever those people might be, whether it was their families or whether it's church or whether it was their communities. They were supposed to guard those people spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Okay? That was what was supposed to happen. Well, today we live in a society which at the very least is, one, is a society that does not guard the weak. And we can think about things like abortion, which are very obvious, but let's think about the fact that we send our females into battle. What does that say? Not just battle, we'll go over there. We'll send our females into a house full of drug dealers. We say, go arrest those guys. We'll send their females into a house that is burning down and tell them, save and rescue somebody out of that house. Female police officers, female firefighters. And this is not to say that women can't do the job. It's just to say that historically and biblically, Women are the ones that are supposed to be protected, not the ones on the front lines of the battle. Then we think about our military, think about rapes, molestation, abortion. Think about the hatred that women feel in our culture as a whole. A lady visited, I was reading a, a book, and a lady visited from Singapore, and uh, this author was given the illustration. And this lady in Singapore, the, the roles are much more his, typical of the historical way women and men interacted. And when she got over here, she said, I'm amazed at how little respect women command in your culture. How little respect women command. Not much, but how little. Okay? And that which we respect is that which we protect. And we do not do that. And we think about our children every day. There's something else, it seems like, about children being abused, children being molested, children being killed, children being beaten. Okay? And no, it has not always been that way. There have always been bad men, yes, but it's not always been, our culture is deviant. Our culture is wicked. Our culture is not like past cultures. Okay? There may be some back there or some place that did some of the things that we did. But for the most part, we are unique in our level of sinfulness in regard to care for the weak. Okay? Think about the elderly. When you get old, what do they say? Leave. Go someplace. We'll put you in a home. Visit you every couple of months. Okay? Or worse, if you're over in Europe, they'll say, we'll kill you. Okay? Your, your, your quality of life is kind of low. You really can't benefit us much anymore, so why don't we just kill you off? Okay? And our hatred for the weak is a failure of men. It's a failure of pastors, failure of husbands and fathers. It's a failure of magistrates. It's a failure of the men. And therefore, when we look at our society and we see the way our women are treated, and we see the way our children are treated, and we see the way babies are treated in the womb, and we see the way the elderly are treated, men, it is us. It is our fault. We are the ones who have left the gates open. We are the ones that said, come on in and pillage and plunder our families and our homes. That's what we have done. So this morning, I want to talk about the father who protects. A father who protects. And obviously, this will apply to all of you. I mean, obviously, a mother protects as well, okay? I'm not, again, not saying that's not the case. If anybody tries to take a child from a mother, we'll find out very quickly that mom protects as well. But society and biblically, protection, especially physical and overarching spiritual protection, is given to the men. And therefore, um, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Okay, so I want to be, this kind of divided up into three parts. This sermon is divided up into three specific parts. One, I'll just give you a theology of protection, principles of of protection from the Bible, looking at different guys and what they did or didn't do and how they failed. Then we're going to look at dangers of protection. What are some mistakes we make? What are some potholes we drive into as we try to protect our families and our homes? And then finally, I'm going to give some application. Just one, one note on this. Really, this applies to physical and spiritual protection. We tend to divide these up into two separate categories, and they are. 
two separate categories. But the principles laid out here don't just apply to the spiritual. Okay? Obviously, you're supposed to protect your family spiritually, but you're also supposed to protect your family physically. We all know this. Some guy comes busting the front door. You're not like, oh, well, I, my children trust in Jesus. I don't need to worry about the rest. You know? No, you're like, okay, I'm going to punch you in the face, or if you're a wife, you might grab a skillet, or you might grab whatever you have in hand, a gun, and you're saying, I'm, get out of here. I'm going to protect my family physically. Okay? So this is physical and spiritual protection. You could add emotional in there too, but emotional is kind of linked up with the spiritual also. Okay, so what I want to do first is just walk through the Bible and give you examples of this. And I want to show you that God's men, God's leaders have been protectors. They have guarded the people of God when they have been good leaders and they have failed to guard the people of God when they have been bad leaders. Okay, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. Adam and Eve. Okay. And there's some debate here whether Adam was right there or not. Uh, some folks think he was. Some folks think he, he wasn't when Satan tempted Eve. But whatever the case may be, he failed in his task of protecting Eve and protecting the garden. Okay? It was his job to say, no, we're not going to do that. No, I'm not going to eat that fruit. No, I'm not going to listen to the serpent. Okay? That was his task. That was his job. He was given the task of defending the garden. And it's interesting as you move throughout uh, Old Testament history, the Levites who had swords were given the task of defending the garden, the temple, and the tabernacle. Okay? So Levites were supposed to defend the garden as well. All right, so Adam failed to protect his wife from the dragon. The dragon came in. John calls him that in Revelation. The dragon comes in, and Adam, instead of fighting the dragon, just kind of rolls over. Okay, sure, whatever. Yeah, you want me to eat that fruit? Great, let's do it. You know, and all humankind is plunged into ruin. Okay, great story of a theologian's daughter. She was young, like eight years old, and she's at a museum, and she's standing there, and uh, there's a picture of Adam and Eve. They're out in some painting from the Renaissance or whatever, Adam and Eve, and she looks at it, and she look, gets a sort of frown on her face, and she goes, you're the cause of all of this. You know? And it's true. Adam screwed it all up. Why? Because he would not protect. He would not guard his family in his garden. Okay. Noah. We don't think about Noah as protecting his family, but that's exactly what he did. God said, I'm sending a flood. Do you want your family to live, Noah? Yes, I want my family to live. Okay, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Build an ark. And Noah worked on it for 100 plus years. Building an ark to save his family. To rescue his family. Okay, that's what he did. Keep going here. Abraham. Abraham's very cool, because Abraham does a lot of different stuff here, protection, a lot of different ways of protecting his family. Um, you could debate how ethical it was, but he had his wife lie to protect her from uh, sexual immorality, from being kind of um, taken, good PG-rated word, okay, taken into the king's household. He had her lie. But here's what's interesting to me with Abraham as the protector. In Genesis 14, Lot is kidnapped and Abraham with his 300 servants which is basically at that time a small nation okay nations weren't huge and it wasn't like it wasn't like you had million man armies or anything nations were not huge when Abraham if Abraham was 300 servants he was probably bigger than some of the countries around them his family was okay Abraham was no small guy and Abraham goes and he massacres these kings and rescues his nephew Lot okay? that's what he does and that was the righteous thing to do. And it would be the righteous thing for a magistrate to do now. If somebody came into our community and kidnapped some of our people, our magistrate could take up the sword and go and rescue those people. That's the righteous thing to do. Right? Abraham was acting as a magistrate, not just a magistrate, but as a magistrate. What's interesting is you get to Genesis 18 and 19, and Abraham rescues or protects Lot again, except this time it's not with the sword. This time it's with prayer. This time he prays. So in Genesis 14, he protects Lot by driving up there with all his horses, camels, whatever he had, and killing a bunch of men and bringing Lot back. And in Genesis 18 and 19, he saves Lot how? By praying for Lot. Okay? He pleads with the Lord, and the Lord delivers, protects, rescues Lot. Okay? Abraham was a protector. He was a guardian. He watched over those things. Okay, we can go on. Think about Joseph. Um, and the way he protected his family or bringing them down into Egypt. I and mean, God obviously orchestrates it all. But when they come in, Joseph sets them up in the good land and protects and guards them. Think of the Hebrew midwives who protected the children by lying. Guarded those children. Protected those children. Made sure they were okay. Think of Moses. 
Two incidences in Moses' life that are worth mentioning. There's more, of course. But two in Moses' life. In uh, Exodus chapter 3, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 2, um, Moses uh, sees an Egyptian slave master killing or beating a Hebrew man. And Moses goes over and kills this Egyptian. Now, we tend to recoil from that. We tend to be like, no, no, Moses, that was wrong. But Stephen, in his sermon, says Moses was righteous to do this. And Israel was wrong to miss it. So in Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, Acts 7, verses 24 and 25, Moses, seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So Stephen says the problem wasn't with Moses killing this Egyptian. Moses did exactly what he should have done. The problem was the Israelites were hard-hearted. And that's Stephen's point through the whole thing. Israel's hard-hearted, hard-hearted, hard-hearted. They didn't see it. Okay, they didn't see it. Well, then later in Exodus chapter 3, Moses shows up. Actually, this might be the end of 2 here. Let's see. Moses shows up, and there are some ladies getting water from a well. And there were some shepherds, this is the end of chapter 2, sorry. There were some shepherds there who were harassing the ladies. And Moses goes and drives these shepherds off, okay, and protects the ladies. So you see that he, as a shepherd, he saw it as his duty to protect and guard. And, of course, as he goes throughout, his, the story continues through Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He protects them by giving them the law, by giving them God's word, by praying for them. Okay? That's how he protects them, by striking down idols. Remember, he takes the golden calf. And he grinds it into dust and makes people drink it. He protects Israel. So Moses was a protector of Israel. Okay? He was a protector of Israel. Of course, there's more examples I could use. David. I'm going to skip over Joshua and Judges. Okay? And even Ruth and how Boaz protected Ruth and brought her underneath and guarded her and, and those sort of things. All these are examples of protection, of guarding someone, of keeping someone. Okay? That's what God's men do. They guard, they protect. Okay? Of course, David, great example. You know, read Goliath or the beginning of the story of Goliath. David goes down there and protects God's people from that. But I want to bring to your attention another one similar to Abraham at the end of 1 Samuel. David has a city that's been given to him by the Amalekites. Or I'm sorry, by the uh, Philistines. The city of Ziklag. And while David is off somewhere... The Amalekites come and attack Ziklag and take a bunch of David's people. Well, what does David do? Well, David, first he prays, and then he goes and rescues these people from their hand. Okay? Goes and delivers them. And David, throughout his life, was a deliverer. He was a protector. He was a guardian. That's what he did. He was the great shepherd of the sheep. And that means he drove off the wolves. He guarded them. When a sheep got taken, he went and rescued them. That's what David did did. Okay. Think of Nehemiah. One more Old Testament example here. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah is building the wall. Okay, and you, There's a couple, there's two things I want to do. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 here. Nehemiah is building the wall and end of chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. So we labored in the work and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may guard, be our guard by day by night and working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes except that everyone took them off the washing. So basically, he stationed a bunch of men around, put them in shifts, and said, protect and guard this wall and make sure nothing happens. Okay? Protecting the people while they're working. If you go into chapter 5, it gets interesting too. In chapter 5, God's people are being taken advantage of financially. And Nehemiah becomes furious at this. Furious at this. And he protects God's people financially. He says you shouldn't be levying huge mortgages against these people. Large amounts of interest. And he becomes very angry. Verse 6 of chapter 5. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. Okay? So Nehemiah protected them physically with the swords or set up this guard. And Nehemiah also protected God's people financially. He said you're not going to take advantage of the God's people. You're not going to do that. And so he became very upset and angry at that as well. Okay, into the New Testament, we could go, with, there's lots of other examples, but in the New Testament, of course, Jesus is a shepherd, and therefore he protects and guards the sheep, and there's lots of good examples of this, but I want to remind you of one. In Luke, I believe this is Luke, let me double check here. 
Luke, yeah, Luke chapter 22, uh, Satan, uh, verse 31. And Jesus said, or the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Hey, what is this? This is a good shepherd protecting his sheep. This is a good shepherd saying, guard and watch over this man. Okay? Peter. Peter, Satan wants to have you, but I am not going to let him do that. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to guard you. Okay? I'm going to watch over you. Okay? And then we go into Paul. And I mean, there's, again, there's lots of examples from the life of Paul. And you know, of course, these, as you move in the New Testament, you kind of move away from the physical examples and into the spiritual examples. But the principle holds. And the principle doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about souls or bodies. The principle doesn't change. God's people need to be protected by God's men. Okay? That's how it works. Okay? In different spheres, it's not my job to stand up here and protect you with a gun. It's my job to stand up here and protect you with the word of God. But it's the magistrate's job to protect you with a gun. That's what he's there to do. And fathers, you kind of have both jobs. You're supposed to physically protect your family and spiritually protect your family, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But as you move throughout... Uh, Paul's life, Paul was constantly encouraging and trying to protect the people from different spiritual harm. All right, and I just want to bring to your attention one, Acts chapter 20 is the one that popped in my head, maybe because I love this passage, but whatever the case is, um, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, talking to the elders from Ephesus, and this is what Paul says to them, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, so he's telling them, remember, you're the shepherd, you watch over these guys. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Okay. What Paul's saying there is protect the sheep like I protected you. That's what he's saying. For day and night I pleaded with you. I begged you, watch out. Watch out for the enemies of God. Watch out for those who would destroy your soul. And men, there's going to be some that are going to come from the outside and some that are going to rise up from the inside. And shepherds have to have the club and be ready to drive off the wolves. That's what they are there to do. They are there to protect them. And if you go to First and Second Timothy, same thing over and over again. Paul tells Timothy, guard the flock, watch the flock. Plead with the flock. Exhort the flock. Keep these guys away. First and second John. What does John say? Don't let that guy come in there and eat. Don't even invite him into your house. Don't do that. He's an enemy. He's a wolf. Keep him out. Protect yourself from them. And on and on it goes. All right. So one of the great jobs ever since Adam in the garden, one of the great jobs that we have is to protect, to guard, okay? to guard and protect those put under our care. Now, it depends. I'm not a magistrate. I don't have an obligation okay, to go out and, and arrest people. I can't do that. Okay, so we all have different spheres of influence, but the principle holds. In every sphere of influence you have, the principle holds. You are there to protect people, to guard them. Okay? And men in particular, as heads of your households and elders of the church, our job is to protect and to guard. Okay? If you think about God, I mean, a couple of different verses here. Just one more verse here from Psalm 30, Psalm 91. Talking about God's protection of us. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God and Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, he, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. It goes on. The point there is God protects his people. God watches over his people. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God protects his people. Okay? So if we're going to be imitators of God as beloved children, if we're going to be like God, then we have to protect. That's what our task is. That's what our job is. Okay? Protect them physically and spiritually, both of those things. Okay. So what are some dangers? So there, the main point is just 
hammering home the point that this is biblical. This is what God's leaders do. This is what God's shepherds do. They watch over the flock. They watch over their homes. They watch and they protect. Okay, That's what God has called upon us to do. And you could probably think, if you're sitting in your pew, think of other examples of that as well. Okay, so what are some dangers when it comes to protection? I'll try to go through these relatively uh, quickly here. It's worth uh, thinking about, though. Um, first of all, uh, passivity. You sit by and just hope it all works out. In other words, you don't, you don't really fight. You just kind of sit by and hope it all works out. And a good example of this is Eli in the Bible. Remember, Eli had his sons, and they were fornicating and eating the meat they shouldn't be eating. Well, the temple, or the tabernacle at that time, the tabernacle is like a garden, and his sons were snakes. And he should have driven them out of the garden, and he refused to do that. He sat by and watched, okay? So one danger we can have is just being too passive, just sitting back and hoping it all works out, not paying attention, not being alert, not being watchful, not looking at what's happening in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our churches, okay? That can be part of it, passivity. And, of course, the flip side of it is you can be too aggressive, okay? You can think every single person you run into is a sworn enemy of yours. And I think if we tip one way as a church, that's the way we tip. Okay? We don't tip toward passivity. We tip toward finding an enemy behind every rock. Everybody we run into is somebody we got to fight with. Okay? You don't want to do that. We are called to be peacemakers. Romans 12 says, live at peace with all men as much as it depends upon you. Okay? You can protect your family by fleeing. Okay? This is one of the things you can do. You don't always have to stay and fight. It's not the only option. You can say, well, you know what? We're just going to step out of this situation. I'm not going to. I'm going to hang out in here anymore. We're going to go, maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's another situation. And eventually it could even be a country. John Calvin said when he's talking about how to submit to governmental authorities, he said if it reaches a place where you cannot submit, the best thing to do is flee. That's what John Calvin said. If you're not a magistrate, the best thing to do is flee. Okay? So some of us can just be too aggressive. Protecting your family doesn't mean you fight every single time you can and you fight every little battle as if it's a big battle. So some proportion there, some balance. Okay. The third danger is just ignorance. You don't know what or who the real enemy is. Okay. Who are the real enemies? Who are the ones we have to watch out for? And here it's important to understand the soul is what matters most. Okay. Now it doesn't mean you don't protect your family physically, but the soul is the key. Okay, so if you're not aware of the dangers out there to the souls of your family members, then you are going to be in serious trouble down the line. You're going to pay the price for it. If you're ignorant of what a false gospel looks like, okay, then you're going to be in trouble. What does a false gospel look like? Because that's the, the most dangerous thing we can have is a false gospel. That's the most dangerous thing to your soul is a false gospel. Because you will believe in something that is a lie. And you will expect it to deliver you and expect it to save you. And it won't. Do you know what a false gospel looks like? If it came into your home through the World Wide Web, would you be able to recognize it and go, well, that's a false gospel. Let me stay away from that. If your family, one of your family members, your wife or your children, started talking, false gospel, would you be able to go, no, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. It's funny. One of my sons is doing a um, uh, literature study on Aesop's fables. And a lot of the questions have been about law and grace because Aesop's fable is all law. Okay? You, know, Aesop's, and it, it, you get exactly what you deserve every single time. Okay? That's, how it pay, that's how it works itself out. Okay? And so the whole thing is about law and grace. And it's been fascinating reading that and helping, uh, seeing how the author of the book is helping this, my son understand the gospel through Aesop's fables. And Aesop's fables is not gospel. Okay? It's moral. Elism, and you can learn some things from it. Don't do this, do do that. I mean, don't be greedy. But there's no grace in Aesop's fables. Okay? Men, we have to be aware of what or who the real enemies are. And that requires labor and work. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, fourth thing, focusing on minor issues. This is one of the ways we fail in protecting our families. I don't want to say minor issues, maybe not the best term. Second tier issues. Issues that aren't as important, okay? And this kind of ties right back into the ignorance thing. Do you know what are the most important things in the life of your family? And if we go back to the leadership thing a couple weeks ago, that's what's most important. Jesus and the scriptures. You lead your family to Jesus. You lead your family to the gospel in God's word. That's where you lead your family. And if anything threatens that, you need to fight. Okay? 
And if it's not threatening Jesus and the gospel, then it's not a first-tier issue. It doesn't mean you don't need to fight against it. It just means you need to ratchet it down some. And sometimes we spend a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on second-tier issues, okay? on secondary matters. Okay? All right, number five. So we've got passivity, too aggressive, ignorance, focusing on minor issues or second-tier issues. Number five, protection does not mean never taking risks. Okay? When you protect your family, that doesn't mean you never take risks. And obviously, if you look at the scriptures, this is, this is what, in the scriptures, men are taking risks all the time. Paul was a daredevil. He was always off doing something crazy. David, same thing. Abraham. Okay? So protecting your family doesn't mean you kind of shrink back into a cocoon and wait out the rapture. Okay? You do things. You take risks. You do things for your family. Okay? And it's easy to be confused on this, on these two, on this. Often passive inward families and churches use protection as an excuse for simply being lazy and refusing to fight. Often families or churches that are really inward oriented use the protection phraseology as an excuse not to fight and to be lazy. We're just trying to protect our children. Well, no, what you're doing is you're harming them because they're going to go out in the world and they're not, they've never had a sword. There are people all around them with swords. They're going to go, what's that? And the guy's going to go, Whoosh. You're dead. See you later. Okay. We have to take risks. We have to teach our family to take risks. We have to fight the battles that need to be fought. And risk means you don't know how it's going to turn out in your homes and in your families. You don't always have the answers to that, but you take and you fight anyway. Okay. And I know there's more. I, want, I kind of want to expand that point a little bit, but I'm going to trim it down and just say protection does not mean that we don't take risks. Okay. And then number, the sixth one ties right in with that. Protection does not mean keeping our wives and our children weak. Okay? That is not what protection is. And this is, again, the kind of mistake we make. Well, if I'm really protecting my wife and my children, they'll be over here quiet, not doing anything. Really. No, that's not what you want. You want warriors. You want fighters. You want people like, yeah, I know what that is. That's a sword. Come on. Come on. Let's go at this together. You know, not mean people, not harsh people, but people who know how to fight. And the goal is to train them to fight correctly and fight against the right things. And you can't do that with a defensive posture, a purely defensive posture. We're just going to huddle down in here in our bunker and hope it all turns out. You have to teach your wives and your children to fight the battle. We should want our sons to be fighting the good fight as we die on our beds. Sons and daughters, whoever's left from our progeny, okay, we should want them fighting the good fight. We don't want them saying, that, well, Dad, what am I going to do now? You're not here to protect me. What am I going to do now? You're not here to protect me. And our sons and daughters are arrows to be shot out in the world, to be faithful warriors in their homes, communities, churches, etc. That's what they're here for. Therefore, you are training them to fight. You're not training them to sit. You're not training them to be quiet. You're not training them to be weak. You're training them to be strong. I think a lot of times men get this confused. We assume that if we're leading, what that means is everybody around us is kind of underneath our foot. No. Leadership means there's strong people everywhere. Your wife's strong. Your kids are strong. Maybe your kids grow up to be stronger than you spiritually, wiser than you spiritually. And they go and they fight the battles. Okay? So protection does not mean we keep those underneath us weak. Okay? And I, I don't know. I, as I think about our churches and churches like ours, it seems to be sort of like a, a problem that I see crop up here and there. And something I want to warn you guys against. We want strong women. We want strong sons and daughters. We want people who know what a sword looks like and know how to fight it. Fight against the enemy. Fight against the right thing. We don't want them just wielding the sword and going and killing people wherever, obviously. Okay? I'm using the sword metaphorically there, by the way. Not a real sword. You know, the sword of the spirit, whatever you want to say. Sword of the word of God. We want, we want them to use it well, but we want them to use it. Okay? And if you're always wielding your sword on behalf of everyone else and no one in your family or whoever's underneath you is doing that, then they're weak. And that's a problem. And that's a problem. Okay, and the seventh thing is, seventh danger, is a belief that keeping our kids away from the world, or we could add our other family members in there as well, but kids especially, that keeping our kids away from the world will keep sin at bay. If we just keep our kids away from the world, they'll be protected. Wrong answer. Okay? It doesn't work that way. All right? It doesn't work that way. And the reason is simple. The greatest threat to your family is your sin and their sin. The greatest threat to your family is not out there. It's not on the internet. It's not on Netflix. It's not down at the gay bar. It's not at the adult shop. 
None of that. The greatest threat to you and your family is your sin and their sin. That is the greatest threat. Okay? And if you believe otherwise, then you're setting yourself up for disaster. If you think you can bar the gate and keep sin out, there's a problem. Okay? So protection doesn't mean you bar the gate and hope all turns out. You fight, especially against the sin in your own hearts. That's what you fight against. That's where the main enemy is. Okay? So, believing that your kids, keeping your kids or other family members, or yourself even, away from the world will keep sin at bay is a lie. And it's one of those things that I think um, is a, a common problem in churches uh, that, that homeschool and they're kind of more family-centered. We kind of believe that if we just bar the gate and keep everybody out, then all will be well in the end. The answer is no, it won't. Why? Because the sin is in you. <laughs> it's in you. It's not out there. It's inside of you. Okay. All right, so let me run through those real quick, and then I'll get to some application. Too passive, too aggressive, too ignorant, Focus on focusing on secondary issues. Uh, doesn't mean don't take risk. Doesn't mean keeping our families and our children weak. Okay, and you can expand that out, too. Uh, uh, what does our government try to do? Well, our government tries to keep its citizens weak. That's what it does. Okay? Well, that's a government that's not protecting you. That's a government that is setting you up for harm, okay? setting you up to be overrun by an enemy. Okay? And we don't want to do that in our homes either. We want to um, make people strong in our homes. And then finally, number seven, uh, keeping our kids away, or ourselves, or our family members away from the world will keep sin at bay. Okay, a few points of application here. First, and this is obvious, there are real enemies out there. Okay? Just, just be aware of that. The, the, it is a battle. I talked about last week the antithesis between righteousness and unrighteousness, between the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ and his followers, and the seed of the serpent, the devil and his followers. There are enemies out there. Not everybody's an enemy. Even if they're not Christian, it doesn't make them your enemy necessarily. Okay, so don't pretend like that. But also don't be so naive as to think there's no danger. And that would be really, really foolish. Okay? Really, really foolish both in your own heart and out there. Okay? So there are real enemies. There is teaching that will destroy you. There is teaching that will destroy your families. There is teaching that will wreck churches. There are bad men who will do bad things to us through their teaching or through other things. So just remember there's enemies out there, number one. Okay, number two. Give your children and your wife to Jesus. Okay? And here I want to bring a couple of verses to mind. Give your children and your wife to Jesus. Um, what is the only thing that can protect us in the long run? I mean, what is the only thing that can save us in the end? What is the only thing that can deliver us? And the answer is Jesus. That's it. There is nothing else that can ultimately deliver us. And there is nothing else that can ultimately save and protect your children outside of Jesus Christ. Okay? So John 10, verse 28 you know what? I want to read Matthew 10.28 first. Matthew 10.28. Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So Jesus set up a priority here, a level of hierarchy. Okay? The most important way you can protect your children is by getting them to trust and believe in Jesus. That is the greatest protection you can provide for your child nurturing them on the ways of Jesus. Okay, and in John 10, 28. John 10, 28. And again, Good Shepherd Discourse. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Never perish anyone. No one can snatch them out of my hand. How can you make sure your children are actually fully, completely protected, guarded in God's fortress? They got to trust in Jesus. So bring them to Jesus. Okay? Now this goes both ways. You want to bring Jesus to your children, and you want to bring your children to Jesus. Okay? And it works a couple different ways. Obviously, you, you, by, you bring Jesus to your children by imitating Jesus, talking about Jesus, preaching about Jesus, telling them about Jesus, having family worship, all those sort of things. Okay? But you also want to bring your children to Jesus through prayer. You want to lift your children up to Jesus. He's the one that can protect them. He's the one that can guard them. He's the one that can keep them. Okay? And I think a lot of times we get really wrapped up in physical protection. How can we protect our children from diseases? How can we protect our children from sicknesses? How can we protect them when they're down at the park? How can we protect them on and on, in the womb, whatever it may be? Okay? And those aren't bad things. 
but do we spend as much time bringing them to the one who can protect their soul, who can deliver their soul? Do we spend as much time doing that as we do about all the physical things we're worried about? Do we pray for our children and plead with Jesus to move in their hearts and rescue them? We don't. I don't think we do. At least I don't as often do. So, bring your children to Jesus. Bring Jesus to your children. Okay? Worship is one of the best ways we do this, by the way. This is why we got all this noise and all these kids in this room. Because we want them to see Jesus. We want them to eat and drink with Jesus. We want them to have water poured on them from Jesus. We want them to hear the word of Jesus. That's why we have them here. Okay. Third thing. I'm trying to decide how to put these. I've got like arrows going up and down and all around my paper. Like put this one here, put this one there. I wasn't quite sure what order to go in with these last three. I'll start with this one. Uh, number three is you must actually care for those underneath you. Okay? I got this from John 10. In John 10, Jesus is comparing the good shepherd to the hireling. And what's the difference between the good shepherd and the hireling? Okay? We think, well, the good shepherd stuck around when things got hard and the hireling doesn't. But why does the hireling not stick around? Okay, well, Jesus tells us. John 10, verse 13. I'll start in verse 12. But the hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and, and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is the hireling and does not care about the sheep. The hireling does not care about the sheep. Okay. And there's this great quote from John Calvin. He says, he who performs all the duties of love does not fulfill them, even when he overlooks none. In other words, when somebody does everything they're supposed to do outwardly, all the loving actions they're supposed to do outwardly, he doesn't fulfill it. But rather, he fulfills them who does this from a sincere feeling of love, from genuine care. Right? So when you're talking about those underneath you, you have to actually care about them if you're going to shepherd them well and protect them. If you don't, you will flee. You will collapse in the day of battle. You will give up. You will not press through if you don't care about these people enough. That's what the hireling does. Here comes the wolf. Hey, I'm done here. I got my paycheck. I'm off. Not Jesus. He loves the sheep. He doesn't run. He stays. And he stayed until he died. And that's our job. And the only way that happens is if we love those underneath our care. That's the only way that is going to happen. Okay, number four. And I'm going to kind of pull together two things here. Um, the word in prayer. Word in prayer, word in prayer. Think about this. Word in prayer. What did Paul, or what did the apostles say to the deacons? We must wear ourselves out with word in prayer. Okay. And obviously you guys have jobs. I'm not saying you've got to be pastor or anything. But brothers and sisters, this is what we've got to do. We cannot deliver our own families. We cannot even protect them from all the physical things we want to protect them from, much less their own souls, which we can't even touch and we can't even reach. We need to plead with Jesus and read his word. And then we must fight for our families. Okay? And again, I'm not talking physically here, although there's some application there. I'm talking you must fight for your family, not against them. Okay? And this is one of the great dangers we run into. We fight against them and for, instead of for them. You must fight for your families. When you read Paul's letters, Ephesians, Colossians, he is pleading with them to listen to him because he loves them and he knows they're going the wrong way. Galatians, he pleads with them. Listen, hear me. Fathers, do you plead with your children? Do you exhort them? Do you say, listen, this just isn't right, son. This isn't going to work. That's not going to bring you happiness. Let me show you here what Jesus says. You plead with your wife. When she's gone astray in some area, you say, listen, honey, I know you think this is right. Let me show you from the Bible what Jesus says. And let's, let's set that, that false teaching aside. Do you exhort? Do you plead? Do you rebuke? Do you correct with all gentleness and patience? It's from 1 Timothy. Is that what we do? Or we just kind of float along? Like, yeah, well, my son's doing that, but it'll work out. He'll grow out of it. It's a phase. You know? Do we care enough about our people to plead with them? To say, no, we're not going to do that. So, as we think about protection, men. And obviously, ladies, this, this means you as well in different areas and different ways. Protecting those underneath us. Guarding them, caring for them, loving them. 
bringing them to Jesus. And I think one of the things we see in this country is oh, we look all around us and we just see disaster after disaster. And the biggest problem is we as men have failed. Well, not the biggest problem. I don't want to be like that. One of the problems, big problem is men have failed to lead to protect their families. I mean, what can we say to a country that murders 55 million babies? And what can you say to them? That we're doing a good job? What can you say to a country that sends women into combat? Yeah, go ahead, honey. Go ahead. I'll stay here. I'll make some French toast. You go fight the battle. You know? What do we say? Well, I say we're cowards. And I say the men in this country have given up in that way. We cannot do that as followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved his sheep enough to die for them. He loved his sheep enough to give them a word that they could follow. He loved his sheep enough to exhort them, to rebuke them, to do what they need to do. And men, if we're going to protect our families, that's what we have to do. We have to love them enough to do those sort of things. And if we're not, we're just going to keep seeing the same stuff. Keep seeing the same women taken advantage of, the elderly rejected, the young beaten and hurt. Okay? So we can't do anything with what's happening out there, but we can in our own homes and here in our own churches work on that and protect our families. Okay, I've rambled on. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do first of all give you thanks and praise for Jesus, the good shepherd, uh, who Psalm 23, we think of him, whose uh, rod and staff guards us and protects us and disciplines us. And we think about the last hundred years of our country, we think about the last hundred years of churches, and we think about the compromise and the wickedness and the pain that's been caused because we as men have failed to protect our families from the lies, from the deceit, and from the physical harm that is out there. We ask, Father, that you would help us to do a good job with this. We can't fix everything overnight, but help us to have a passion and a heart to guard our families from theological error. Help us to have a passion and heart to guard our families physically from harm that might come. Help us to have a passion to guard our churches and our communities from the same thing. Keep us from confusing passion with anger and passion with um, meanness. Keep us from being mean and angry at those around us. But help us Lord, to be diligent and faithful as we try to shepherd those you put underneath our care. And I pray for our sons, Lord, lots of young men in this congregation. And one day they will be shepherds. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us. The Father's here to raise them well. And we ask, Lord, that you would help those boys that grow up to be faithful, strong, compassionate shepherds. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.